You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, Episode 84, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, it's just you and me this week. Uh, I'm trying to stick to a schedule this year of doing one episode where it's just me and then one episode where it's a guest. I love having guests, but I also like having the place to myself. <laughs> I can talk about whatever I want. And uh, this episode, I'm going to talk about worm castings. Uh, what are they? Uh, why are they so good for the garden? And uh, why I don't need to buy them? And, and related topics like that. Uh, we're going to have a good discussion about this. I thought I'd give you a little bit of update on the state of my garden here. It's finally, uh, we're finally getting some heat. It is June 26, 2019, as I record this right now. And uh, most everything in my garden is up. Uh, my beans are up. My greens are up. My potatoes are up. Um, my uh, Even my heat-loving things, the squash, cucumbers, uh, zucchini, um, tomatoes. And the tomatoes are about six inches high, all direct seeded outside. Uh, I got eggplants direct seeded outside. They're growing, although they're not they're not six inches high. I just planted them very recently, uh, and they're all under plastic. Um, basil's up. All my herbs are up. Everything's up. Everything's growing. Uh, looks like we're uh, you know the growing season is finally here, and the they're still getting down to maybe uh, 10 degrees Celsius at night here. Um, but the, and the days aren't super hot, maybe 20-ish sort of thing is a warm day right now. But with the domes, it's it's much warmer underneath the dome in the gardens where I have those. And so uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm using that system to try to move things along and generate heat and get the soil nice and warm and and facilitate growth of the vegetables. And of course everything is mulched to minimize my uh, watering. I'm actually I haven't done much watering at all this season. And, and actually to be honest. My uh, my watering hose, which goes from my house to the garden, I broke it. I, I jammed a nail through it, uh, like in April, like before I even needed it. I can't really use my watering hose in April because uh, the water in it is frozen all the time. <laughs> so I really don't get to use it very much. Anyway, I put a hole in it, and it took me. I just fixed it a couple weeks ago, and I've been using water from my goldfish pond. Um, to water my garden just using watering cans and that sort of thing, believe it or not. Um, but that's just, I mean, I'm creating the image like I'm going back and forth to the garden with the watering can. But in fact, I just haven't really needed to water it that much. The combination of the mulch, and that's another good reason to sow things in the spring. You get, you know, at least here, fairly regular rains. Uh, yeah, I uh, really haven't used that hose at all. There, I think there was twice so far this year I've actually used the hose on my garden. Other than that, I just use a watering can here or there right, where, where things seem to need watering. Um, anyway, back to our topic, the topic at hand. What, let's, let's start off here. The, the, the topics are what are they, why are they good for your garden, uh, why you don't need to buy them. So what are worm castings? Um, and of course, this is all just the stuff I've gathered from uh, University Extension websites. I'll put a couple links to resources I found useful. Uh, in the show notes for this article, if you're listening to this on YouTube, they'll be in the description box. Uh, if you're on my Maritime Gardening Podcast website, every episode has what we call show notes, just note, you know, just notes beneath the show. It has uh, information on the coupon codes and offers from the sponsors and just, uh, you know, a, a really short write-up on what this uh, episode's about and any sort of links uh, for resources that uh, I think you might find useful if you want to do some additional reading and that sort of stuff. Um so, and this information is all available from, you know, good university extension type research. Um, so, worm castings, these are the result of composting organic matter with worms. Uh, worm casting just means uh, poop, right? I think it's probably marketing. Oh, they're castings. They were casted. I mean, this is, you know, what comes out of the worm. The stuff goes in the worm and the stuff that comes out of the worm. Worm castings are what comes out of the worm. Uh, and this is the result of cold composting. When I say the result of composting with organic matter, this is cold compost composting. If it's hot composting, it's just too hot for the worms to really set up shop. Um, so cold composting is a, a form of composting which relies on micro and macro organisms. A worm would be what you would call a macro organism. A micro organism would be something really, really small like a bacteria. Uh, micro just means small. Uh, let's contrast this approach uh, cold composting with uh, hot composting, which is very popular with a lot of people. Um, hot composting, that all of that heat is really what it's being generated by 
microorganisms, primarily things like bacteria. Uh, it can be it can be very fast in terms of breaking the material down if you do it correctly. It can be six to eight weeks, and you can be done if you've if you've done it right, right? If you've got the right combination of materials in the compost heap, the right carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, hot composting will even kill weeds if you can generate that kind of heat. But that's the catch if it's done right and if you've got the right conditions and all that sort of stuff. Um, let's go back to cold, cold composting because that's the kind of composting that allows uh, worms to set up shop and do their work and create the worm castings which is so beneficial for your soil. Uh, cold composting by contrast takes quite some time. It can take up to six months. Uh, certainly, you know, in in my backyard where I, or I guess you could say I compost, I'm going to talk more about that later, but it takes a, quite a while for things to break down. you got to remember where I live, uh, for a good part of the year, it's, it's just cold, really cold, and for a certain part of the year, it's just frozen. You know, sometime in late December, uh, the world freezes here, and it just stays frozen till about April, right? The ground is frozen, and ain't nothing happening. And sure, if you made a big enough pile and covered it well, well enough and so on and so forth, you could... I suppose you could you you could get a compost pile that that works uh, over the course of the winter, but you have to put some thought and a bit of design into that. Not impossible though. Um, anyway, it's uh, cold composting is much slower than hot composting, and it doesn't kill the weed seeds at all. Um, you know, if you want if you want to see some stuff grow, just take some cold compost and throw it on the ground and watch the weeds appear. <laughs> Certainly, uh, mine's full of weeds. Um, but you know, I've done lots of YouTube videos. And there's plenty of resources out there to talk about how to deal with weeds in a garden, how to keep it to a minimum. Uh, another, uh, an advantage of cold composting, aside from the fact that it's the only w real way to get worm castings, is that it's about 4% uh, higher in nitrogen than hot composting. And uh, it uh, it's also allows a much wider range of materials in terms of setting up the compost pile. So if you're doing like a hot compost, you got to have a layer of green and then a layer of brown and a layer of green and a layer of brown. You got to put some thought into that ratio all the time. You're all the time managing a ratio. Then you're turning things and all that sort of stuff to keep to keep uh, keep the right ratio and the right balance of things in the right place at the right time. Uh, with cold composting, you can pretty much throw anything on the pile and just slowly over time, everything on that pile is going to become this brown uh, composty sort of stuff that's full of worm castings. Um, so it's a much easier, the cold composting it sort of suits my approach to guarding. It's just much easier, much lazier. You really don't have to put much thought or energy or uh, premeditation into it. Really, you're just throwing everything in a pile and letting the living things that are in that pile, including worms, uh, do all the work for you and make all the decisions for you. And because they're good at it, uh, that's the best way to have those decisions being made. Um, so why are so that's just a, a sense of what worm castings are just worm poop and they're the pro product of composting, cold composting. Uh, why are they good for your soil? Uh, well, to understand that, I guess you might want to understand uh, what the worm is doing. Right, the worm processes decaying organic matter. Uh, it gathers. I mean, it's a tube. Can you think about it, the way a worm works, right? It's a tube that goes a tube that goes through the soil. Uh, the worm processes. Uh, the worm gathers the material and microbes that are in the material. It's the protozoa and fungi and stuff like that. Uh, it gathers the material, the decaying plant matter, and the microbes that are in it, and it breaks everything down while making a meal of the microorganisms, right? It's, it's really after the microorganisms that are in the decaying plant matter. That's what it's making a meal of, primarily. Um, but while it's doing that, it's sort of dealing with everything else as well. You know, in a sense, you, you do a similar thing. If you eat a whole bunch of plants, if you eat some carrots and stuff like that, um, you're getting some water out of the carrot, and you're getting some nutrients out of the carrot, and then there's all this fiber that's just kind of going out the other end of you. <laughs> Right. And of course, I guess if you wanted to, you could use that as a kind of fertilizer. But, you know, you're doing the same thing. You're after some things that are in the carrot, but there's a lot of stuff that's just going back out. But you've helped break all of that stuff down. Right. Once a carrot goes through you, it's going to turn into soil much more fat, much more quickly than if you just threw a carrot on the ground. And it's the same thing. What's going on with the worms There's all this organic matter in the soil or on top of the soil. And the worms breaking all that organic matter down 
while it's trying to get what it wants out of that. And then what comes out of the worm is just breaking down that much faster and the um, nutrients and so on that's in what comes out of the worm is much more available for the plants. And of course, there's, there's microorganisms in your soil that are uh, perfectly happy to act on what comes out of that worm and break that stuff down even further and make that more available for your plants so they can take it up through the roots and all those little fine fibers and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, other qualities of uh, worm castings is that they have excellent aeration, excellent porosity. It's just the texture of the soil that they create. Uh, nice structure, excellent drainage, and moisture retention. I mean, what a wonderful combination. The water can get through it, but it also holds water, right? The, the plants can get through it, but it doesn't fall apart, right? You have the porosity, so the, the roots can get into it, but it's got structure, so it doesn't wash away or fall apart. It's got drainage, so instead of the water rolling across the top, it sinks into the soil. But it's got moisture retention just by the nature of its structure. It, it swells up when the water when it's watered, uh, and excellent aeration. So by by meaning that most of your the roots of your plants uh, they need water and they need all kinds of different things, but they also need air, right? If the roots of your plants are starved for oxygen, the plant dies, and the worm castings provide in terms of the, what they're doing to the soil structure excellent aeration. So it's really the gold standard. I mean, and you don't have too much of anything or you don't have too little in terms of your NPK. Uh, you got one point and, and these numbers are going to vary. If you look look these up on various sources, you're going to get uh, slightly different numbers than mine. So every every number I'm going to quote here, just let's say plus or minus 0.5, but uh, 1.5 for nitrogen, uh, 2.5 for phosphorus, uh, phosphorus and 1.3 for potassium. Um, you know, that's analogous to compost right um, so but it's a slow release fertilizer so let's say a lot of people at least when I was growing up I seem to recall people were always throwing what's called 6 12 12 on their garden 6 nitrogen 12 phosphorus 12 potassium right um, so you think of 1.5 2.5 or 1.5 well, that stuff's useless it's not very strong but the difference is when you were throwing 6 12 12 in your garden uh, when it rains that's going to you know wash out and it's it's not a slow release it's an instant release it's going in it's basically there for a season the plants hope hopefully some the plants can take some of that up between rains before it gets washed down into the subsoil and that sort of thing uh or just washed away <laughs> right in, down the street or whatever um this is a different sort of uh thing and it's a slow release so as this uh, as the worms are creating this and as it's being added to your soil it's just there and it's waiting to be taken up by your plants and the right amount is going to be there when your plants want it um, so that's why it's good for your soil right it's just this ideal source of a kind of slow release fertilizer with all these great properties that improve your soil quality and your soil health but you might ask well geez where can i get this stuff and of course, if you go to a garden center, um, you can buy it. You can buy it. <laughs> you can buy a bag of it, and it's going to cost you. There's a range of prices. Uh, it's not cheap. It's not a cheap thing to buy. You're basically buying expensive dirt, <laughs> in a sense, or expensive poop. It's it's your gold standard for a kind of manure, right? It's worm manure. Um, and so, so when you're buying that, you got to think. It's not like it was made in the store you're buying at, right? This was something that was shipped from who knows where. And soil is not a light thing. So I mean, a lot of if you're paying, I don't know, 12 bucks for a bag of it or, or whatever you're gonna pay. Um, number one, I'd look at the bag and see, it. are you buying worm castings? Or are you are you buying compost with worm castings in it? That's two different things, right? Um, but also, whatever you're buying, what you're paying for mostly is uh, oil, gasoline, right? <laughs> The, the price of packaging and shipping and bringing that thing to the store where you bought it. Um, so you're, you're really not buying room castings, you're buying oil. And uh, once all of the value of the oil that went into the worm castings is 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 netted out from that, then what you've got left is the the, the amount of worm castings you have, and then you use that on your garden. But you don't need to buy that. You don't need to buy it because if you're a no-till gardener. That's already being generated in your garden anyway. 
right? If you have a garden and you keep a mulch on your garden, you keep the soil covered all of the time, you've got worms and other things in your garden all the time, at least when it's warm enough, right? This time of year, all summer long, uh, some of spring, good deal of fall. There's stuff going on in your garden. There's all kinds of stuff breaking down that mulch layer uh, and turning that into uh, worm castings and other castings. I mean, if you've got a garden, uh, it's not just worms in your garden, right? You've got slugs, and you've got snails, you've got beetles, you've got all kinds of uh, microorganisms and fungi. There's all kinds of things that are breaking that down, not just worms, right? When you buy worm castings, I don't know if you're getting 100% worm castings, but if you've got a garden and a mulch in your garden, you're, you're basically getting what came out of every single insect, every single living thing in your garden that is somehow making use of of your mulch also everything in your garden that made use of some other living thing in your garden right all of those things are digesting things and sending things out the other end kind of thing or wherever it comes out right all that's going into your soil and it's all making the nutrients that are a result of that a further breaking down of those nutrients making available to your plants so you don't need to buy worm castings if you have a no-till garden because your garden is co always covered. You've always got a mulch. That mulch is always being broken down by the living things in your soil. And all of that good stuff is being deposited right at the top of your soil where, you know, to a large extent, the roots of your plants are. But every time it rains, you know, little bits of that good stuff sort of trickles down. And if you've got all those worms in your soil and all those living things in your soil, They've got little tunnels and holes and, you know, they're working the soil. They're moving around in there. They're aerating your soil. And in addition to the properties the worm castings have, the, all those living things in your soil are aerating your soil, moving things around, doing your tilling for you, making use of all of that stuff. Even as maybe, uh, maybe it's the case that with cold composting, that the seeds, the weed seeds, uh, don't break down and they don't but one advantage to using no-till as opposed to having a compost pile and turning that compost over and even if you're using cold composting you know I, I do a bit of that and when you take that cold compost and put it on your garden the weed seeds grow like crazy whereas if you've got composting just going on in your garden bed where that layer of mulch is touching your soil uh, there are going to be weed seeds deposited in your soil but they're going to be underneath the mulch and a lot of not all of them of course but a lot of those weed seeds are just not going to germinate underneath the mulch there's not enough or maybe they germinate and they're not strong enough to push their way through right or maybe the conditions are just right and a lot of them just rot in the ground and they become food for the organisms in your soil right so there's a lot going on there and it's not just a straight you know warehousing of weed seeds a lot of the weeds i mean <laughs> all, almost all the mulches i use in my garden are full of weed seeds and the cold composting process does not break them down and all those weed seeds are there and yes i get weeds but it's really not a big deal i do not spend a lot of time i go up my garden this time of year because the flies are so bad i go up my garden in the morning around i don't know 5 30 in the morning uh, maybe six it depends some days i go out there to record uh, a video or something like that and sometimes i just go out there just to have a little look around i might spend five or ten minutes out there and that's the time i put into my garden i might do a little bit of tiny bit of weeding or i might do a little bit of mulching or you know whatever and i, I tend to do more mulching than weeding if, if there's a little bit of weeds growing somewhere you, you throw some grass clippings on it it just smothers it out and kills it uh, anyway getting off on a diatribe here A lot of people that are proponents of worm castings and what they call vermicomposting uh, will talk about, when they say vermicomposting, they're not referring to what's happening in my garden where I've got a mulch and there's just worms and other things living underneath the mulch and they're breaking down that mulch and making a kind of castings in my soil. What they're talking about is having 
big plastic containers with this sort of industrial setup or semi-industrial setup or amateur setup or whatever uh, somewhere in your home inside your garage or something like that and you're taking your table scraps and you're putting them in this plastic container there's a whole bunch of worms in that usually what's called red wigglers um, and there's all these uh, you know worms that are in that uh, container and they're slowly and gradually making vermicompost, which is worm castings, in that container. And you're, you're perpetually adding table scraps to that, and they're perpetually breaking it down. And, you know, over time, you're, you're adding stuff to that. And then at some point in time, uh, there's a way to separate this, this stuff out, and you've just got all this beautiful black stuff in that, in that worm bin. And uh, often they'll talk about needing uh, red wigglers. I've even ha heard people say to me, that uh, I'm doing it wrong in my garden because I don't have red wigglers. And uh, I mean, a lot of the talk about red wigglers, it's just a, a type of worm. There's earthworms that are in your garden. I've got night crawlers in my garden. I even actually do think I have uh, red wigglers in my garden because I have a lot of worms right around the surface, which is where red wigglers like to be. Um, but I'm not 100% sure, and I really don't care. I mean, the, when I add a mulch to my garden, it gets broken down. If I had two inches of something... Uh, this time of year, uh, by September, it's almost all gone. So that stuff went somewhere, right? <laughs> it, it broke down. Uh, and there's, there's more things than just worms breaking it down. There's, you know, other living things in there. But there's, whenever I dig in my soil, there's worms everywhere, right? So maybe they're not, you know, red wigglers are supposed to be the best, the most, you know, they, they, they process their weight in decaying organic matter every day. But I don't really care if a, that's what I have or some other kind of worm. All I know is I got all kinds of worms, and they're breaking that stuff down. And maybe they're only uh, processing 90% of their weight every day. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not going to go to some store or order red wigglers from some, you know, uh, online whatever. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if you've got worms, they're going to do the work. And if you're creating an environment that worms want to be in, a perpetually mulched environment, you're just going to get more and more and more and more worms. So, yeah, maybe a thousand red wigglers can do the work of 2,000 regular earthworms. But if you have 5,000 regular earthworms, who cares? <laughs> Sorry, that's my thought on the that's my thought on the topic. I think part of the reason that there's so much talk and uh, obsession about red wigglers is because they're the ones that can handle the temperatures that exist inside a ver vermicomposting indoor operation, right? If you take the plastic container and you have it in your garage and you got your food scraps in there and so on, it gets fairly hot. And uh, the wild worms, a lot of different varieties of worms cannot live in that environment. They can't take the heat in there and they just can't uh, exist in that setting. They need uh, a more natural setting. The red wigglers can live in that sort of semi-artificial environment and they're totally fine with it. Uh, so that's why I think there's so much discussion about needing red wigglers. And so if you are doing uh, vermicomposting indoors, I guess you may need red wigglers. Uh, I know that I, I didn't, if you go way back and listen to some of my old recordings of this. I actually did, I can't remember what year it was, maybe 2015 or 2016. I actually did try vermicomposting in my garage. So, you know, I had a, I actually wasn't that impressed with it. I mean, the, I had a container and uh, I think in a matter of about three weeks, it was totally full. I couldn't add anything to it. And it's end up, you know, you need dozens of those things. Uh, for me anyway, maybe I was doing it wrong, but uh, you would need a and I guess it all depends on how much, uh, you know, table scraps you produce. And in my house here, we cook all our food from scratch. And, you know, we fill our, our, we have a little bowl by the cutting board. And we're perpetually putting food scraps in there and we're preparing food. And we fill that thing almost every day. So in a week, uh, we have a lot of vegetable matter food scraps. And uh, they don't break it down that quickly, you know. It breaks down slowly, so you, I would need a lot of those things. Remember, there's four people in my house. The, 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 the vermicomposting operation was basically started and halted, and in in, in under a month, that thing was full. And uh, if I waited maybe three weeks, a little bit of room would appear. I could put like a, a couple more cups of stuff in it. And, and the whole point of this isn't to trash that. 
idea. I mean, it was it was a fun sort of thing to do, and it produced some decent soil. But at the end of the season, after an entire winter of of trying to keep that thing going as much as I could, you know, I might have had um, a couple gallons of this really nice black stuff. Um, whereas, you know, in my garden where I've got this, sh you know, I'm basically sheet mulching. That's another term for, uh, you know, the kind of mulching you would do when you're no-till gardening. I mean, there's worms everywhere working all the time, all season long until it gets too cold and then the thing sort of shuts down, right? But that is a lot of activity. That is a lot of organic matter. And this is just stuff, I actually, it reminds me, I got some stuff in my car. I mean, I just grab bags of stuff that people throw away on my way to and from work. People always put this stuff out before compost day, garbage day, that sort of thing, and I just grab it. And all that stuff is put on my garden beds. It's worked on by the worms and other organisms in the soil and turned into this great stuff with all these great qualities, right? So from in my mind, that is just so much easier and so much more natural, so much more, you know, I'm using the word organic, but I mean, it just by organic, I mean, it's 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 just a natural sort of thing to do. Um, it's just uh, something that would it just naturally evolved for me as a gardener. Right? It just evolved out of the practice of gardening. That's what I mean when I when I say organic. It just it was just a natural sort of thing to do uh, in terms of trying to keep my uh, minimize how much I had to water in my garden, minimize how much weeding I had to do. And the side effect is that it makes all of these organisms happy and they're just perpetually breaking it down and creating this great uh, material that's so good for your soil. So yeah, you don't need to verm vermicompost if you want to have worm castings in your garden. Just keep a mulch and you'll have worm casting. The worms, if, if you mulch it, they will come. That should have been the title for this episode. Uh, keep a mulch in your garden. The worms will show up. They're going to start making worm castings. So you don't need to vermicompost. I mean, if you want to, and if you're interested in that, go for it and enjoy. But you don't need to, right? You do not need to vermicompost to have good soil. Keep your soil covered. You'll have good soil. might not happen in year one. It might take a couple of years, but you're going to have good soil. And because you're not vermicomposting indoors, this is all happening outdoors, you don't need red wigglers. You know, there's all kinds of things out there working on that. Uh, organic matter and they'll do a fine job and they'll take care of it wherever you are there's stuff out there and it, maybe you don't have a lot of worms the first year but they'll show up trust me they will show up they will take over and you'll have all the worms you could ever want and lots of other things too your garden will just be alive with living activity and all of those living things will be doing the work for you and making your soil a place where your plants will grow and proliferate so there we are that's my take on the whole worm casting thing and the vermicomposting thing and that whole market. Uh, I think gardeners are led to believe or led to want things they don't really need uh, and that there's a much easier way, a much more uh, just simple, you know, elegant way to get worm castings being generated in your garden by just throwing yard waste <laughs> on your on your garden beds. If you enjoyed this uh, episode, uh, please check out the show notes. If you're on YouTube, check out the description box and look at the offers from my sponsors, Best Seeds, Seeds, the safest gardening products. There's coupon codes. Uh, if they sell something that you need, buy it from them, and that'll help support the show. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please like, share, subscribe, uh, share this with other people, and uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for listening.